नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग वी आर बैक ऑन आवर सेवेंटी एपिसोड ऑफ ट्रिपल ए वीकली वेबिनार सीरीज वेलकम टू ऑल दी जॉइनिज पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड टूडे वी आर कंडक्टिंग ए वेबिनार ऑन फॉरेंसिक अकाउंटिंग एंड इन्वेस्टिगेशन स्टैंडर्ड रिलीज बाय इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ चार्ट अकाउंटर्स ऑफ इंडिया एंड दीज स्टैंडर्ड आर एप्लीकेबल टू all the kind of uh, transactional audit or puffy transactions avoidance transactions avoidable transactions all under the insolvency and bankruptcy code maybe it's section 43 section 45 49 50 66 or even 69 all these sections all transaction report are covered by these standards and we also have the opportunity and uh, Uh, we are uh, displaying our happiness that we have an expert with us today c a durgesh pande and c a durgesh pande was also involved in drafting and making of these standards welcome durgesh ji and it is a privilege to us as well as to our audience that an expert on uh, these standards and also an expert on the uh forensic accounting and investigations and i believe you are you are doing a lot of work in on this domain uh, although ankit is also doing uh, the forensic audit ankit is also uh, empaneled but the uh, focus of ankit is primarily on the bank frauds and on the ibc however i believe durgesh you are into you are associated with you are working with lot of investigating agencies also so we would have the benefit of your opinions uh, during this discussion today so thank you very much for joining us so we probably this the 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 forensic accounting and investigation standards are very very large this actually it's not possible to continue with the entire i would only say that all participant should read Uh, these uh, uh, standards so these standards has been brought to us it has been drafted by digital accounting and assurance board of the institute of chartered accountant which is chaired by chaired by the ch charan ji charan jyot singh nanda and also the vice chairman of this board is ca uh, dayan nivas sharma and we also have uh, ca dr durgesh pande and his name is also mentioned in this uh, standard and he has also contributed a lot in drafting of these standards when we talk about this uh, forensic accounting and investigation standards it basically uh, the objectives and the standards or the objectives of this particular standard is just to provide the professionals when we say professionals presently the standards are only applicable to professionals like only chartered accountants because these standards are issued by institute of chartered accountants and when we talk about professionals we only mean a qualified chartered accountant who is conducting the forensic accounting and investigation assignment is that correct durgesh ji this is yes, a sir. absolutely sir the idea is because the institute has a mandate that it can bind only professionals so the standards as of now they will be applicable for any uh, chartered accountant whether in membership uh, whether in practice or not so cop is not important he just has to be member of the institute of chartered accountants of india <clears throat> so the main objectives of this standard is the to provide a minimum standard for undertaking the assignments like forensic accounting and investigation and the users of these uh, uh services like see like one very very important aspect that i actually came to know that the institute never thought of uh, talking it as a audit the institute thought that this is not an audit so this is not something which actually can be considered as an assurance or certification uh, services so these are only forensic accounting no i i'll just come back to what is forensic accounting and what is investigation i'll come back to that but the basic objectives are the indi indication of the quality of services and the regulators and the agencies with an appreciation of what can be expected from the professionals and also a kind of guidance which is a technical and how to implement these uh, standards these are the objectives of this uh, uh, standard 
Now, when we see the framework, which is governing the forensic accounting and investigations, so basic, it is the key components of this framework is the basic principles, the basic principles of uh, forensic accounting and investigation, key concepts, and then standards, and then guidance. So the, in fact, this is a combination of two things. One is the uh, standards on FAI, and also the, uh, the, there is a technical and implementation and technical guides, which are also released by Institute of Chartered Accountant, while these standards are mandatory, whereas the implementation and technical guide is recommendatory. So the, these standards are saying that these are the minimum set of requirements that apply to all members of Institute of Chartered Accountants, effective from 1st July 2023. I may make it very clear that when we say effective from 1st July 2023, that means that all assignments starting on or after 1st July 2023 and not the date of the report. Is that correct, Dirgeshi? It yes, is sir, not absolutely. the date of the report. Absolutely, sir, because the standards were way back, you know, launched in August 2021. The standards were launched in August 31st, August 2021. So these were recommendatory since then. So just to have, uh, there are some finer changes made, finer changes made in the definition, and then they were made mandated along with the uh, implementation guide. Of course, the implementation guide itself is recommendatory, but then they were mandated from 1st of July. So not to have any confusion because they were not mandatory. So probably someone who's signing a report on 1st of August or 5th of August, it's not expected that he or she may have followed the standard. That is why the rationale that uh, any engagement which begins, if the appointment letter is after 1st of July, only then the mandatory nature is there and not just for the date of signature of the uh, report. Date of submission of the report is not considered for mandate of these standards. So I believe because these the applicability of these standards are uh, applicable from the even assignment, engagement uh, letters, how to draft engagement letters, how to assure many things in the scope of work. So that actually cannot happen when we talk about the date of the report. That can happen only when we begin the assignment. So then the when it is so far twenty uh, standards have been released, and their numbering is also like I I, I was curious to know uh, the numbering system of the standards. The hundred series are being used for standards on key concepts. Two hundred series are standards on engagement management. 300 series are used for on executing assignment, 400 series are used on specialized areas, 500 series is on standard of reporting, and 600 series is being used or on the quality control. So Durgesh, any, any understanding why these kind of uh, uh, classified numbering and why the 20 standards, was it possible to have one that conceptual clarity I'm saying somehow I don't have in case you can provide to the audience. Yes, sir. What yes, is sir. the structure of the standards by Institute of Chartered Accountant? How, why 20, why not one? This is please. So, sir, when, when the concept was floated of uh, starting the standard, this was way back, probably the first cut of the standards of the first draft of the standard, it was published in February 21. If I'm not wrong, I have to see exactly the book, February 21. So it started the standards are a product of the covid era of the covid era which which the professionals when they were free and when they contributed to this because all work that we do for the institute is voluntary so it was an effort of 70 80 volunteering volunteering professionals who contributed during the covid era i do remember people every wednesday we had to have a meeting when the starting time was 4 pm we didn't had a ending time because those were covid times and we were free so it started then. Now, when we started the standard, sir, uh, one a, a quick disclaimer which I would like to give is, I am using the word we, but then please consider all opinions which I give is my own opinion. I don't represent the institute and I don't uh, speak on behalf of the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. I was just part of the drafting body from very beginning. So I understand a lot of, uh, you know, thought process that have gone. Yes. So, so sir, when the standards, when the drafting process of the standards started, we tried to study as to what has happened in this domain globally. So we have found there are 
Canadian standards, Australian standards, and the American standards. However, we cannot call them standards per se. They are just, say, say if we call the American standard, that is called as SSF-1. Now, this is just five-page document which gives a very basic idea and it introduces the concept of forensics. Same is the case with Canadian standards and the Australian standards. These standards are, they do not have full facets of an engagement. They are very high level document running into very few standards. So the level of guidance provided by these standards is very, how do I say? I mean, they are targeted at experts who are practicing in this domain. So the standards presume a lot of knowledge already existing with the professionals who are supposed to practice in this domain. Now, when the thought process of developing our standards started, this being an emerging area, our being a large country with diverse set of professional, it was thought of to give a detailed guidance rather than issuing just one standard, which presumes that a lot of people know a lot of things. Sir, if you will read these standards, even after having 20 standards and even after us do, done reasonable work in this field, even we still find that there are places where the standards, we can say that they're ambiguous and they are subject to interpretation. So even after drafting so many standards, there are a lot of places which need more clarity, which will evolve over the period of time. Now, coming to the series. So that is the reason why we had full set of 20 standards so that it covers right from landing of the assignment to doing the assignment to supervising the assignment and including some specialized area reporting quality control as well. Now coming to the series, what is the series? Now these series, these series are in line with global practices. If we see the internal audit standards, if we see the accounting standards, if we see the auditing standards, all standards comes in series. Now, sorry. Now the rational as to hundred series. So this introduces the standards. Two hundred series is on engagement management. Then we have two hundred and ten, two hundred and twenty, two hundred and thirty. Where two hundred and ten speaks about the nature of engagement. Say if we want to elaborate more on what is forensic accounting, what is investigation, what is litigation support. We have a room of 211, 212, so on and so forth. That is why the rational has been taken to distribute the standards in logical sections and creating logical compartments. Yeah, Sir. I think that's that's very <clears throat> fair explanation because see, like uh, uh, there are uh, bankers uh, who are also uh, our audience. There are insolvency professionals who are our audience. And I'm not expecting that everyone, then there are a lot of advocates who are our audience. So I, I was not expecting that everyone is a chartered accountant. So this explanation I thought may be required by them because a chartered accountant would know the structure of uh, uh, standards internationally and by the Institute of Chartered Accountant. So therefore this explanation will actually have a meaning to them. So the framework again, for in, framework governing forensic accounting and invest investigation Again, there are two things, implementation guide and technical guide, whereas the implementation guide is focusing on best practices, methodologies, or approach on how best to apply the prescribed requirement to achieve the objectives of the uh, standard. And then the technical guide is clarification as to what extent the standard applies uh, in a certain situation or in a specific industry or under unusual circumstances considering the technical or operational uniqueness of the same and how the best achieve the objectives that is all recommendatory. So the important definitions that I could see in these uh, standards, one is the forensic accounting and investigation, litigation support and fraud detection. So this is also a kind of assignments that any uh, chartered accountant can do one is the forensic accounting. So now I would say that to all the bankers and to all the professionals that the, they should not use the word uh, audit. Whenever they issue an engagement letter, <clears throat> they should only say forensic accounting and investigation. 
and if it is only for the litigation support so that can be added for litigation support or for fraud detection but the forensic accounting it is actually defined it is defined because it is not something that basically somebody is going to do the accounting but analytic analysis of the accounts available converting those accounts into different formats so that the information is surfaced the required information is surfaced that is what is the part of the forensic accounting where we use the existing record existing accounting existing documents in such manner in such formats that the non compliances or alerts will be generated so that is what is probably called forensic accounting which will help finding the ultimate objectives of a particular assignment now the investigation is basically a systematic and critical examination of the facts records and documents for a specific purpose and other forms of evidence for a specific purpose such as an alleged legal ethical or contractual violation so this is the investigation that we do and in this investigation even the uh, interviews interviews is also part of the standard it is required that any professional doing these kind of assignments will also do interviews with the management employees or any other party now the litigation support is that there are you see like i will come to that particular slide where i am showing that what we think that the uh, forensic accounting and investigation assignments are only restricted to few areas like the bank fraud or uh, usage of funds or ibc but in fact uh, durgesh would uh, uh, support me in saying that there are 20 more areas where this particular specialization is required and those areas are coming up and ankit you can say something with the yesterday what amit shah was saying you you probably uh, we have heard that together but you understood it better because he uh, what amit shah was doing that they are creating something like 25000 such professionals who would be uh, a forensic expert it is only yesterday's news please ankit please uh, uh, make our audience uh, uh, know know about that so those of us in profession understand that whenever we talk about economic offenses then the digital trail or digital forensics become a very very important evidence that uh, comes into play so yesterday when uh, amit shah ji was briefing the parliament about the new uh, laws which will be replacing the iipc crpc and evidence act he stressed upon how the new provisions or the new acts that they have drafted take care of the digital forensics in the process of the uh, uh, the 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 criminal uh, scrutiny of or or or, or uh, rather i would say adjudication of uh, criminal acts of uh, you know day to day life so he talked about how the police forces across india would then have access to mm -hmm. forensic uh, experts who can dig out digital data who can dig out other forensics which are related to crime and that uh, those facilities will help in uh, strengthening the process of law and rather the command of law over you know uh, finding evidence to punish the accused so currently i believe that is weak because if we talk about digital forensics then yes i believe police has certain support from forensic experts but then maybe that's what they want to strengthen and maybe provide a centralized availability of data to the various police forces across india so that's also on the card so i think this profession actually is going to grow a lot because the uh, various agencies are also taking help of this profession various uh, litigation supports are also required income tax department also needs uh, the expertise of uh, such professionals similarly gst department similarly the criminal investigation any kind of uh, financial crime all agencies require the support of these professionals so these standards forensic accounting and investigation standards are actually released by institute of chartered accountant at a very very right time while the country is thinking about different kind of uh, evidences and those evidences will become now after the change in the indian evidence act these evidences actually will become 
officially approved evidences. This is what I wanted to say, Ankit, because Amit Shah ji, he has announced that these, these, these findings of the forensic experts will be considered as the evidence for a uh, proceeding, maybe criminal or maybe civil. Similarly, in litigation support, suppose there is a uh, uh, there is a dispute regarding the operations and management under the Companies Act, and the one director is accusing the other. I feel the the courts will start giving this assignment to the experts to find out the actual uh, loss or actual diversion of the funds. So the fraud and detection also related to the employees, related to dealers related to even any kind of stakeholder that also would pick up because mostly the businesses are more worried from their own internal structures and not from the outside. The most of the threats to the businesses are from internal, uh, it, it, these are internal threats rather than external threats. So uh, basic principles of the forensic accounting and investigation, these are all very, very common, like independence, integrity, and objectivity, due professional care, confidentiality, skill, and competence, con contextualization, uh, contextualization of situation. Now, this part, we must understand the context, in what context the assignment is being given to us, the objective of the assignment. So that is very, very important to understand when we take up this assignment, Primacy of truth, respecting rights and obligations, separating threats from opinions, and then quality and the continuous improvement. These all basically uh, are the key concepts, key framework, and the integral part of the forensic accounting and investigation domain. Like the nature of engagement is very, very important. Fraud risk, law and regulations of a particular assignment. Now, suppose we are doing an assignment under the RBI master circular then we must know the details of that RBA master circular. So in case we are uh, doing the assignment under the IBC, then we must know what the section 43, 45, 49, 66, 50, 69 says. But the other is applying hypothesis. Now, Durgesh, I would like to understand from you regarding how do we apply hypothesis and how do that becomes final evidence in a proceeding? You are, you are mute, please. Yes, yes, I am sorry. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, uh, sir, uh, the standards that is applying hypothesis, as we know, applying hypothesis is one of the key concepts that is standard 140. Now, the moment we start an uh, engagement, I understand our audience is restricted to the application of IBC, but then the standards have a wider applicability and hence the concept of hypothesis. Now, to start any investigation, let us take the IBC investigation, uh, the, uh, the transaction review, or any other investigation. Say the bank has appointed for uh, investigation as to whether the funds have been siphoned off or whether the funds have been diverted. We have to start with a presumption. Rather, we have to start with an assumption, a raw thought that yes, the company has created a step down subsidiary in an overseas jurisdiction and the company has transferred an amount of say 10 million Indian rupees to the step down subsidiary in overseas jurisdiction, which money has never returned to the uh, returned back to the company. So we can start with a hypothesis. We can start with a raw thought process that this may be a way how the company has removed money outside the books. Now this working theory, this working preposition would be called as hypothesis. This is the basic question that needs to be answered throughout the engagement for which the professional is appointed. During the course of engagement, he would be trying to answer these questions and collecting evidence. So ultimately the engagement, the appointment when made has to come up with the appointment has to come up with objective based on that objective a hypothesis mm -hmm. has to be created based on this hypothesis evidence is to be collected and this evidence has to be presented in the report this is how the entire 
concept comes up sir good good see so uh, I, I see ankit uh, with like I, I see i will go these two to two, two slides which are basically focusing on what kind of assignments are possibility uh, possible uh, to which are covered under these standards and this also gives a kind of uh, overall uh, uh, availability of the market for these kind of assignments so ankit after this we will be you you you, you will please take the questions eh? because there are questions also so now this this particular standard so are applicable on such assignments now how the assignments uh, what kind of assignments are available in the market one somebody can ask you to uh, review my books of accounts for finding errors and irregularities then uh, somebody can say that the business was interrupted because of some natural disasters or accidents or any other event so we need to calculate the financial loss somebody can say that the uh, the the estimate of the uh, inventory in a warehouse fire or in a theft or to estimate of a loss of profit because of any kind of event that also uh, can be the assignment because this is basically not accounting this is not assurance this is a different kind of assignment then somebody can say that we are nowadays thinking that our wastage in the production is very high so that also needs some kind of forensic accounting and investigation how our uh, the uh, consumption or our wastage is higher or our consumption of raw material is higher and the sebi mandated examination into financial related matters and then, then there are whistleblowers where the complaints are filed before any agency and when the complaints are filed before any agency in that case that agency including sebi can also uh, mandate such assignments and also in the case of some where irregularity or fraud in the purchasing department of a company purchase of raw material or any other things there can be crimes there can be some unusual activity activity amongst the staff members so these these are various kind of uh, uh, like uh, somebody can say that our procurement had is also uh, looks like uh, very fishy and then coming to the main stream of assignments like the borrowers default loan and the npa misappropriation misappropriation of funds diversion of funds and then like employees theft the securities fraud falsification of the financial statements and identification of insurance frauds diversion misutilization siphoning of the earning of the company by putting in additional uh, expenditure or by uh, then then concealing the property of the company and the manipulating the accounts financial uh, statements then then there can be uh, the some some manipulations for uh, in manipulation of the stock price uh, by uh, padding up the profit or by window uh, uh, kind of window dressing of the balance sheets and then manipulation in the price of these uh, uh, shares uh, then various instances where the portfolio managers are in fact doing some uh, then investigating agencies like the investigating agencies like this in this cbi or the enforcement directorate they also engage income tax department gst department so all these are various kind of assignments and the litigation disputes so these are all various kinds of uh, uh, events where these assignments can be given i think now ankit we can take the uh, questions uh, uh, you can see the questions and then we can take it one of the questions is from uh, um, from uh, so so this question says that when we talk about these standards what how do we use these for puff transaction audit so like if an ip or rp or I irp liquidator let's say is getting a transaction audit done so what part of these guidelines or these standards can help the ip to enforce a certain quality of the report we will come back to this we see we have not yet covered this part we are coming to this part so we something would, that I, we can I answer have noted, yeah. uh, i have noted this question how finally it would uh, how the ips are guided by this uh, standards then of course there is a question from sandeep chitkara ji is asking what is the what kind of opportunities are available in the area of forensic accounting for non ca so i believe there is plenty of opportunity available i am hardly seeing any restriction uh, per se some departments might restrict this some may not restrict this but then 
right now there is nothing which the says that only chartered accountants can uh, do forensic accounting it's a different uh, fact that the institute of chartered accountants of india uh, have has taken this effort of you know putting up these standards to have a reasonable standard of the reports you know made by chartered accountants uh so Please, uh, ankit i would like yeah. to add here mm -hmm. uh see when since this uh, fai standard has been issued now most of the agencies will actually get information about these standards and they would prefer to get the assignments done from a qualified chartered accountant because everyone wants that the professional should be regulated so there should be a process of disciplinary action there should be a process where the uh, somebody is regulated guided and also done uh, some kind of processes are mandatory on the person anyone in the market who is not regulated doesn't have such standard doesn't have mandatory uh, regulations doesn't have a disciplinary action process or a structure how can that report be trusted yes a chartered accountant can always say that i am also hiring an expert into the digital investigation and that person would be helping me but basically the assignment now would come to chartered accountants also and most of the private limited companies or all those people they have set up their own forensic labs those would be appointed by the chartered accountants as an expert because these standards also provide that the experts can be appointed with a definite scope of work and that report can be used by the professional for giving a final report so i believe that mostly this these assignments would be restricted to chartered accountants only and what is your opinion durgesh sir actually <clears throat> you know i i have been practicing in this domain since 2015 probably when forensic was not mainstream 2014 i was pursuing my phd in fact when you spoke about uh, you know uh, our honorable home minister emphasizing the use of forensics i would go back to 28th august yeah that was the date of my convocation when i was awarded my phd degree by him in the university there's a university in gandhinagar where i was awarded the degree and in the convocation address he spoke that very soon any offense involving a sentence more than 6 years the opinion of forensic professional will be mandatory so he spoke this in 2022 august 2022 that was uh, when our convocation was held now this was done to increase the conviction rate now coming to our standards when the institute of so so before why i am giving you this background is that because i have been practicing in this domain since long i had written several letters i was in contact with several senior officials of the institute council members as well that we have to have something which govern the forensic practice you of all the people must have faced the music that because we didn't had any benchmark we didn't had any standard the quality of reports were always grey you really cannot rely upon the report and there was a sense of frustration as to what should be done if the reports are not of a particular quality so sir the institute came up with this thought and idea to create a minimum benchmark as to what should be the report because there is nothing there is nothing except for the st forensic standards in our country which regulates this profession that is why the institute has come up with minimum set of standards that if a report is being issued it has to have minimum this if an engagement is is being done it has to have minimum this now because the legal framework of the chartered accountants act is such that anything which is issued by the council is binding only on chartered accountants that is why any guideline any standard issued by the institute is applicable only for chartered accountants i very strongly agree with your thought that chartered accountant would be the preferred partner now to conduct a forensic investigation because first the relevant stakeholders will have that assurance that a particular set of standard applies to them and the report or the quality of work has to be of a particular grade second 
there is a disciplinary mechanism say if you engage me for some work and i don't follow the standard i have done something which is contrary to the standard you always have that recourse of filing a complaint before the institute so that i am put to line again the standard is flexible enough because we don't consider in in an not just in an ibc proceeding not just in digital domain sir we have done work where we were supposed to calculate the value of the sonars and radars ab uh, affixed in uh, in in the coastal belt so we have done such work now how are we supposed to value as to what is the what is the value of the sonar what is the value of radar that is totally alien concept so we have to take domain expert that is why the standard very categorically fais 230 we have fais 230 which is using work of an expert and then because digital domain has been so important because digital is everywhere so that is why we have a specialized standard e discovery that is evidence discovery in digital domain that is 420 that is already there so because chartered accountants you if if the work is done by a chartered accountant there is recourse available to the stakeholder be it banker be it rp there is recourse available therefore chartered accountants will become a <clears throat> a professional of choice if it has to be uh, if if there has to be uh, you know if they want a particular grade of outcome because for everybody else they may they may uh, choose to follow the standards or they may choose not to follow the standards but for a chartered accountant it is mandatory to follow the standards hence i according to me chartered accountants will become a professional of choice for this i agree with you sir also i uh, i feel that the defendants or uh, defendants of uh, this uh, uh, report in case there is a negative report against any person they would always use that the report which is given by the professional is not as per is not compliant to the uh, fai standard and that would be taken by the court very seriously if a report is not compliant to standards that means the impact of the report will be completely diluted and that person will get an escape route and thereafter the stakeholders they would not trust a report which categorically will not say and confirm that this report is compliant to fai standards so ankit do you see, think that this is going to happen that every report it will be considered incomplete or kind of incorrect in case it is not saying that the report complies to the standard now i will use this opportunity to say how the valuation standards are playing a role so see it started way back in 2017 or 2018 rather when these standards first started uh, uh, some kind of an enforcement and the legal enforcement happened then but you know it's a uh, it's a process where you know the standards are taught the standards are then accepted by professionals and then subsequently they are enforced so recently we have been seeing so many ibbi orders where the regulator has been saying that the compliance with standards was missing and therefore there have been actions on valuers who have done those reports or completed those reports without following standards so uh, that is what i think is uh, expected here as well that if the institute says that yes these standards are mandatory and tomorrow on peer review or any other investigation it comes out that these are not followed then that will be a problem for uh, the professional So therefore, compliance is important. Another thing which is very very important here that I would like to add is that this is also seen as a very very big opportunity, where uh, what what this is called is the role of a data scientist, and uh, this data scientist role is something where I think all professionals are excited to be part of because uh, big data, large data, crunching that, trying to find out evidence out of that, it's something which is uh, a highly highly technical job and. it's something which is not uh, i would say exactly similar to what chartered accountants are doing presently for large audits but it is it, i can say that there is similarity in the two because they are again when you're doing audit you're not doing investigation but you're still doing a lot of verifications on large data so therefore that synergy is available for chartered accountants to do to become data scientists of the future good thank you so no i think we can move now to the guidelines issued by the institute of chartered accountants those are dated 22nd of july 2023 for 
forensic accounting and investigation standards, like how to implement it. So these, uh, I, I'm not very like kind of, uh, will not be a very, very detailed discussion on this, but basically there are about few uh, uh, guidance that they are saying the professional may consider certain high level organizational factors that influence the engagement fraud risk area. So this, these are the guidelines and these can also be working as a checklist. Any professional who is doing an assignment can also use this as a checklist. The nature of the business and the industry of the organization, the business environment and the stakeholders of the organization, the corporate governance and the entity level control framework, the existence and effectiveness of its anti-fraud programs, risk management and compliance culture, public perception and investor confidence, extent of automated controls and manual controls, job rotation and mandatory leave policy. These are some of the very, very uh, macro level uh, thoughts that you have to develop before you uh, start an assignment. Then uh, the little bit of micro level, the professional may consider the following fraud risk indicators, which are also called red flags and the early warning signals. And these are some very basic, like the, if, we, if the patterns are found like this, like suppose a, a pattern of similar audit adjustments proposed year after year, persistent cash flow problems, I mean, if somebody can recall, in the case of Satyam, the auditors were looking into the consistent cash flow problems. The management was always ready to take loans while there was uh, thousands of crore lying in the bank FDRs. So that should have been a trigger to them. That should have been red flag to them before they actually uh, assured the uh, accuracy of the financial statements, uh, even when the organization has regularly reported profits. Now, if the organization is reporting profits and still having cash flow problem, this is exactly what happened in Satyam. Outstanding results when the results of the industry has suffered a downtrend. Now, in case there is, a, they, you see, like when everyone knows that the thermal power industry is not doing well, and if one company is reporting very good results, that should be it. That should be a red flag. Transaction in the books are not recorded in a complete or timely manner or are improperly recorded as to the amount, accounting period, classification or the policy, unreconciled reconciled subsidiary or general uh, ledgers. These are some of the micro level <clears throat> and, and also uh, maybe some more, uh, the usual financial conditions of the organization also should be seen, unusual financial ratios when compared to the competitors, significantly outpacing competitors in the industry. Sudden change in the fortunes of an organization, maybe huge loss or maybe huge profits, Constant financial pressures that we've already discussed. <clears throat> then um, excessive related party transactions, inadequate segregation of duties or employees unwilling to share duties, excessive cash transactions, employee behavior and lifestyle inconsistencies. You may see a people person having a salary of uh, 50,000 rupees and coming in the car in the office, lack of transparency and information sharing, unexplained inventory discrepancies, lack of independent oversight, hierarchy structure in the organization not followed in decision making, inconsistent, vague, or implausible responses from the management, like limited or poor written policies for the employees, lack of internal controls, instances of management override the control, significance of the operations, brand value, reputation, the employees are suffering from the financial damages. So these are the basic issues which actually, which actually can be seen before an assignment is taken. Why I have listed in my PPT such things? Because I feel that for a professional conducting the assignment can also use these as checklist. So this is important that once you delegate something to your staff, these checklists can be provided to them. And on each checklist, a kind of comment can be obtained from your uh, uh, field workers who are actually doing the job. So this is what is the reason that I'm stating this and I have taken it from the guidance note of the Institute of Chartered Accountant as issued under these standards. Similarly, there can be something which is related to revenues. Uh, the unexplained variation between budgeted revenue and the actual revenues. Revenue recognition manipulations like booking revenue prematurely or improperly to inflate revenue figures. Revenue booked during the period and followed by revenue reversals at the beginning of the period. Fictitious revenue or sales not supported with proof of delivery or service. 
increase in quantity of the sales without increase in the sale value that actually can be used for even consuming the, uh, uh, the, the stock. Unexplained or unapproved high discounts, especially toward the period and that is used to uh, reduce the uh, profitability and to reduce the sales. Non-compliance with the industry specific regulations and accounting standards related to the revenue recognition, that's also. And then something regarding expenditure. Some, something like the expenditure uh, and the vendor onboarding, siphoning of the funds through fictitious or inflated expenditure in the books of account. Personal profiteering and kickbacks through vendor employee collusion is, is some of the very, very common instances of fraud. Analyzing the major spent, spent booked, major expense booked, which should be commensurate with the size of the business and nature of the operations of the organization. Budgeted spending in comparison with the actual to identify reasons for deviation, especially those that are indicative of any unusual patterns. Expenses booked towards the end of accounting period as adjustment entries, sudden spikes in the business volumes to vendor, and whether the vendor was onboarded through the organization's regular onboarding processes, and also use of ghost vendors. I mean, nowadays, we actually see a lot of such things, but then now I will actually come to the uh, scope of work for the assignments under the IBC. But before I do that, Ankit, in case there are some questions. Not really. You can continue. So now I would actually, uh, as I, I would uh, say that the most of the insolvency professionals, what we are learning as an insolvency professional, what we are learning from these standards, that the scope of work for the assignment must be very, very clear. Now, when we say the scope of work under the IBC, it is not restricted to only the profit transactions. Because see, like what I have listed, this is not provided in the standards. I have listed it from my own understanding. One is the preferential transaction under section 43, undervalued transactions under section 45, undervalued transactions with fraudulent intent, that is section 49, extortionate credit transactions, that is section 50, and then fraudulent trading or fraudulent transactions under section 66. Then coming to the concealment or removal of the property of the corporate debtor, that is where I can actually go to section 69 of the IBC and I can also prosecute the uh, responsible peoples. Then property of the corporate debtor is concealed. That is where I can again go to uh, section 69 and section 70. Then any debt due or any uh, or from corporate debtor is concealed. Any property of the corporate debtor is removed fraudulently. Falsification, uh, uh, falsified books of accounts of the corporate debtor, section 71. Related party transactions that actually will help us uh, uh, to understand the uh, operations of the company. And then finally, we would say that the main objective of the assignment handing over to an expert would be to building evidences for the legal proceedings as, uh, uh, as basically you're saying evidence discovery. So these are the scope of work for the assignments under the IBC. When we uh, talk about uh, assignments under IBC, so there are some basics and those basics like basically now I'm coming to the preparation of the work. So the first part was for the person who is signing an engagement letter, engaging a professional has to be very, very careful about the uh, what is the scope of work that he should give. So I emphasize, emphasizely say that this is not only four sections of 43, 45, 50 or 66. The kind of uh, presentation I have given that this should be the scope of work. This should be now uh, the scope of work because this will be used by the insolvency professionals for different, different sections. So this information, again, because see, in the insolvency professionals, uh, the qualification is not only restricted to chartered accountants. An engineer can also become an insolvency professional. A banker can also become an insolvency professional. Anyone who has a management experience of more than 15 years can become an insolvency professional so that not everyone is a chartered accountant. Not everyone can understand the accounting and also the forensic accounting. Therefore, the scope of work that I have now said that would be suitable to all and the surfaced information and kind of uh, evidence discovery would become easier and that will help us in recovering those lost money. 
So, uh, so anything, Ankit, you would like to add here? Uh, uh, so, uh, basically, when we talk about uh, uh, the forensic audit or transaction audit under IBC, the biggest challenge, rather even for forensic audits, which we are doing for banks, many such audits, the biggest challenge is data, gathering data. Uh, for an example, we recently are doing a case where we have been provided uh, the financial statements of the company, which are available in the MCA. And there is total refusal on giving us any other information. So the only thing that we've got is bank statement. Again, in the bank statement, we are not able to find who the amounts have been paid to or who have they been received from. Even that information is very difficult to dig uh, into by banks sometimes. So the limitation always comes in on data and there the garbage in garbage out principle comes into place that how do you do anything when you have almost no data? You can use all the tools in the world, but if that correct data is not available, you can't do much. Um, that's the basic difficulty, I think, in all processes. So then this uh, uh, standard, the guidance uh, note, they are also providing us the checklist like how to conduct the work. So these can be used as a checklist. So there are separate uh, uh, checklists, which can be said it is for uh, the basics for all kind of uh, uh, the uh, requirements, like for all sections. And then there are uh, specified uh, checklist, although the checklist can be much longer, but this is what is provided in the guidance uh, note. This is for preferential transactions. I'm not going to read all that. This is for undervalued transactions. My objective is to bring to your understanding that this is what is available in the guidance note, and this is what is available in the standards, and what is mandatory, what is recommendatory. So all this is my, it's like I'm not going to read all this, but then yes, there are all kind of uh, work procedures which are mentioned in the guidance note, and those work procedures, it also goes up to how to verify purchase, sale, loan, employee records, transactions, all that is provided in this. Uh, and then finally, coming to the loan accounts also, when we try to uh, talk about the uh, audit, which is uh, mandated to us by lenders, as per the master circular of RBI, there also the guidance note provides how to conduct the preliminary anal analysis of the borrower's profile, then what are the other documents and the relevant information which is required then what are the uh, kind of procedure that you would conduct? So this is where the uh, total guidance note is actually uh, helping all the professionals conducting the uh, assignment or all the uh, stakeholders who are mandating these assignments to professionals. So all these uh, are mentioned in the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, standards. No, I'm actually coming to you and I'm trying to explain what exactly these standards are. Like the first standard that we see, it is basically standard number 110. And these are the, the nature of engagement. These are basically the uh, what kind of engagement it would be. Basically, it says that there must be a clarity on the engagement and it must define the forensic and investigation engagement scope and approach and then identify the specialized skills and the resources required and then the documentation of the work process, what kind of documentation that would be retained, that also is getting covered in standard 110. And then the fraud risk is covered under standard 120. These are the fraud uh, risks. Then uh, documentation for the work procedure, again, for each standard, there is a, uh, first of all, there is an objective, then there is a work process procedure, then there is a quality control, and there is a documentation. All basically, all these uh, um, aspects are covered in each uh, standard. Like in case you can see this uh, uh, standard 130, this is regarding the law and regulations. What law is required to be applied and what under what law this kind of uh, uh, assignments are being handled. So these the documentations are also mentioned. Uh, similarly, applying hypothesis. This is also provided in standard 140. So, so this is what kind of document that you would retain. So like that was document like the, all these standards in 100 series. Now, when we see that the standards in 200 series where the engagement management, here I would like to 
uh, say to all my insolvency professionals and all my bankers that this engagement objective must be very clear. And the uh, documentation for the engagement, that also should be very, very clear. The engagement letter, that has to be very, very clear engagement letter. So the and the various, uh, like as, as I said, the uh, objective has to be mentioned. So these are the kind of uh, items which are required to be mentioned, financial statement, in, whether it is for financial statement manipulation, whether it is for funds diversion, is it for anti-money laundering, is it for tax due or tax evasion, is it for related party transactions, or is it for valuations or estimation of loan, or it is for the transactions under IBC. So that has to be a very, very clear uh, mandate uh, which is required. So investigation services. So similarly, all uh, these standards continue like this. So one, a couple of things that we have to, uh, since we have to manage everything, so uh, this PPT would be available. Uh, so all these standards are uh, similar and all these standards will provide you as discussed originally, 100 series, 200 series, 300 series, 400, 500, and 600 series. So all these standards basically would be applicable to the assignment, which is the assignment. So the, let us not start, uh, call it audit. We will uh, always call it as uh, forensic accounting and investigation assignment. Uh, so there is uh, hardly any reason that we should continue, but I'm saying that all these, these standards are uh, similar. We can take some of the questions and then we can see the closing remarks from uh, Durgeshji and uh, Ankit. So we would not uh, go to the entire PPT because that's what is an indication that I wanted to give to all the audience. So I believe we have taken care of all the questions, only that puff uh, transaction audit and applicability of the standards on that. I think we can maybe add some more, uh, uh, maybe, maybe add some more comments on that. Uh, apart from that, uh, maybe understand uh, uh, from the practical experience of the Geshri on what kind of information can really, you know, maybe is easier to fetch for an effective transaction audit, given his kind of experience in the practical side of forensic audits. So I would specifically ask Durgeshji to attend to this insolvency processes and looking into the three uh, like limitations. One is the limitation of records, limitation of data, and non-cooperation from the uh, promoters. Now the third is what kind of disclaimers are accepted. And fourth is how can the conclusion be drawn and how can the, once the, once the data is not available, the audit is not able, it is not completed, then what kind of report should be given and how the assignments can be closed. I think this is very important for the audience to understand. So, sir, <clears throat> quickly, let me answer the question. Uh, answer the question. So, the first question which Ankit was telling that regarding applicability of the standard. So, uh, I understand the board that is DAB. They uh, they have <clears throat> they are in process of constituting an expert group, which will probably come up very soon. Of course, with the approval of the council, they'll be coming up very soon as to all types of engagement, not just IBC, but all types of engagement which may or may not be covered under the FAIS. Of course, we get a lot of feeling that these are and should be covered, but then uh, I understand the DAV will be coming with a uh, detailed clarification and it will come in with a detailed guideline uh, regarding the applicability. Second question that you said, coming to the actual work. So, sir, in my experience, <clears throat> I have had hundreds of appointments on behalf of law enforcement agencies. I have done cases on behalf of IPs as well, but the problem everywhere is the same that we don't have data. In fact, had we had data, the investigative assignment would become very easy. That is the presumption in investigation that you will not be having data. The presumption in research is that you will not be having data. You have to find the data. Now, coming to how do we do the assignment if we don't have data? So never ever in a case we will be having the complete tally data, complete accounting records, complete ERP records. And even if we have the accounting records or the tally uh, records or the ERP records, it would not be possible to rely on that because those are all manipulated and punched. So the only sacrosanct document, and I have created a principle in my office that the only document with, on which you can rely upon is the bank, bank statements. That is the only document on which you can rely. 
you start with the bank document you create a hypothesis you start with the bank documents each and every transaction of the bank document has to be studied a trail has to be found out a thought process as to why this transaction happened has to be think has to be thought in the mind of the person whosoever is doing the work reviewing the work and preparing the report having said that it i very strongly agree that it is very difficult to give a conclusion in such situation but then sir we have one of the basic principles as contextualization of situation and then one of the basic principles i understand <coughs> the honorable supreme court has upheld the judgment of telangana high court in i suppose rajesh kumar or bs you know bs limited something like that where state bank of india the bank, uh, the honorable supreme court has told state bank of india that you have to before classifying willful defaulter you have to give a uh, hearing to the other party now our standard very strongly dwells upon that one of the basic principle is audi alterum partum that is you have to give opportunity to the other side of being heard having said that when we have multiple situations where the uh corporate debtor is not answering specific questions shying away from answering specific questions not giving data that has to be brought on record through communication we also have a standard on communication protocol so the multiplicity of communication asking specific questions asking sharp instead of asking that give me your data instead of asking questions generic questions like that we have to say that give me all sales made to abc enterprise in the month of august because i suspect that those transactions are fraudulent if you ask such data you will be getting response positive negative that i really don't know but you will be getting response which can help you build your case and you can draw a reasonable conclusion based on that sir the tone and tenor and the reply of the person whomsoever we are auditing the auditee as we say though we don't use the word audit here but then tone and tenor of the person whom we are investigating that will give us a feeling as to whether he is speaking true or he is speaking lie at the end we are not castigating as to whether there is a fraud or not that is not my job my job ends by presenting a statement of fact probably a week ago i had a hearing in high court of gujarat where the defense counsel said that the chartered accountant has not told that who has committed the fraud so the honorable justice was very kind enough to say that that is not the role of chartered accountant the chartered accountant has told that 9 crore has been siphoned off it is the job of the police officer to find who has done the fraud so our role ends by telling that there is a suspicion and strong evidence which says that money has been diverted then it is for the investigating agency because we have very limited rights that is all i will say sir <clears throat> sir mute hai aap yes yeah, ankit <laughs> i was just saying that you were saying sir yeah i think it's fair enough so we can conclude it uh, like this that the insolvency professionals and the banks any stakeholder who is giving a mandate must take care of the engagement letter scope of work and objectives and as far as the data is concerned this is an assumption that this uh, forensic accounting and investigation is a difficult task it is not easier so let the uh, so it should not be a hurdle that the data extraction and creating evidences like evidence uh, deliberate uh, detection or discovery this is also is the part of the scope of the professional so whatever and to what extent that depends upon the various circumstances so nobody can say that this particular uh, professional is better or this is not better but yes there are information available on the domain also some public domains also and then it's finally the disclaimers limitations and the final opinion the standard says that the one is the fact and the other is the one is the uh, the truth about the fact and the other is the opinion the opinion also is required to be given as per the standards however the conclusive report is something which is required by the various benches of the ibc they are saying that the report must say conclusive that this is a transaction which is covered under section 43 that conclusion is required 
this is a transaction which is covered under section 45 that kind of conclusion is required without these kind of conclusions although one thing that i must say that in the entire ibc and in any of the regulations made there there is nowhere it is said that a an expert which is called a forensic auditor would be appointed it is only said that the ip can take and ip can appoint experts so it is not mandatory that the expert is appointed in all the cases in case the ip himself can also uh, dis discover the uh, fraud or discover the evidences that also would be acceptable to the courts it is not required that if a resolution professional is reporting a transaction with evidences and with the documents nobody can say that this particular part has not been evidenced it has not been supported by a report that's not required in the ibc so this is where i want to conclude that one <clears throat> don't give a chance to your defendants to the promoters so that they should say that this report is not conclusive this report is not compliant to fai standards don't make your uh, litigation uh, like weak so use the standards mandate it very carefully and also take the reports which are compliant to these standards this is where we can conclude thank you very much thank you durgesh pande ji and uh, thank you ankit thank you audience and we always feel happy when the audience number increases so that is actually motivating us and we come with a new subject every saturday at 11 am every saturday thank you very much thanks a lot thank you sir thank you thank you durgesh ji thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you so, so much. much thank you for inviting me thank you